Sadhguru, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and thanks to all the volunteers who have worked so hard. Um, so my first question to you is that when I first heard about you many years ago, when I first heard about you many years ago, I, I rolled my eyes and, <laughs> and I muttered something about uh, guru types. <laughs> And until few few uh, uh, months ago, when my sister gave me your book, Inner Engineering, which happens to be New York Times bestseller, um, it changed my perspective. And when I was working on this interaction, I came across a few interviews of yours, one of them being with a senior writer from my field. And, and he was vehemently attacking you. <laughs> like, he was try <laughs> trying to... <laughs> frame you for being a like fake and he himself is accused of plagiarism in <laughs> so so my question is that why does a person uh, connected to spirituality on its path is everyone feels uh, entitled to judge them and honestly if it wasn't New York Times bestseller book I would have not read it. What, what is it about the West, <laughs> the West stamp that we can't do without it? I mean, there are so many books, and if, unless Americans don't approve of it, it just doesn't make sense. Why is that? This is multiple questions. <laughs> about, uh, about people's resistance uh, to someone like me, when I see someone like me, someone who is not messed with himself, okay? <laughs> he didn't cut his hair, he didn't do anything, he's simply the way nature intended him to be. That's all the problem they have with me. You… they think you have to belong somewhere. You have to be this religion or that religion or this party or that party, you got to be something. Today if you look at the world, now that you mentioned America, and it's also beginning to happen in our country in a big time, big way, in, in imitation of United States, I would say. See, in United States, uh, you ask, talk to anybody, they'll say, I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican. What this essentially means is, you have no clue what is democracy. If you say, I'm this, and my father also was this, and my grandfather also was a Republican, so this, this, this I am. What this means is, you have become a tribe. You, you've become a? A tribe, you know. Mm -hmm. Once you become a tribe, a tribal war is inevitable. It's going to happen somewhere. Democracy means every time you must see these five years or four years, whatever the term, how they have functioned and individually you make a choice whom to vote for. You already committed to vote to a particular party no matter what. This means you become a tribe, you've gone back to feudalistic way of living, but you're talking democratic language. So this has happened in a huge way in United States. So uh, these jokes keep going around. Someone trying to convert a Republican into a Democrat. So they came and asked, why don't you vote for Democrats, you're… see what kind of president you got. So he said, no, I'm a Democrat, my father… I'm, I'm a Republican, my father was a Republican, 
and my grandfather was a Republican, so I am a Republican, that's it. So this guy asked, suppose your grandfather was a jackass <laughs> and your father was a jackass, what would you be? He said, of course a Democrat <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, uh, we are taking things from there all the time and in India also slowly we are moving in that direction unfortunately. About New York Times <laughs> New York Times, <laughs> a lot of things you could say about New York Times, but I think the, their president is speaking as to what is New York Times, I don't have to say a thing <laughs> uh, We still have not got out of the Firang syndrome. You know what's Firang? I know. Yeah. <laughs> of course. So, we've still not gotten out of that Firang syndrome, uh, it has to come from there. Today, why do you think so many people are talking about yoga? The yoga they're talking about in India is… is largely a rebound from the American coast. They're not talking about the yoga that is here. This is the source of yoga. And uh, if you… people's understanding of yoga is… Uh, yes, Sadhguru, that brings to me a question about… Um, our, our roots ingrained in yoga and spirituality. But where has it got us as a nation, as a country, as a continent? What has it given us? Like, um, I know what you say about karma bondage and I, I will quote you. <laughs> no, I'll quote you. If somebody, he says about karma, breaking karma bondage, that if somebody breaks your leg, don't go after that person's leg. Fix your leg and go your way. I understand that sounds fantastic. But if somebody breaks your leg and you go your way, somebody again comes, break your leg, what do you do? And then Why others see… Why do you think see... people are so much interested in your legs? <laughs> <laughs> no. no, Sadhguru, you're, you're, you're literally taking it. But, but tell, tell me, don't we have a history of thousand years of yes. invasion after invasion and didn't we grew up hearing this from our mothers that, oh, if somebody rubs you wrong way, the only thing that they say is, oh, Bhagwan dekh raha hai. What? So, Say this, sir. This I mean, we as a land, I mean, I, I don't know much about history, but this much I know that we as a land, we have not, and thanks to our spiritual education, that we have never gone to invade a continent or gone to, for a conquest like that. But, but what, where has it got us? Where has it landed us? So why not imitate West? Okay. Uh. You must give me a few minutes okay. <laughs> because okay. you, you raised a whole lot of things about history. So what has uh, the spiritual process given us as a land, as a nation, as a culture? You must understand this. This is a… let's understand this very clearly. Here we always focused on individual development because without creating great human beings, there is no great nation, there is no great culture, there is no great world. World, nation, society, these are just words, it's just you and me. What kind of people we are, that's the kind of society, that's the kind of nation, that's the kind of world we will live in. So we always focused on individual development. In this we produce stellar human beings, absolutely fantastic human beings for thousands of years who created a fantastic culture. And let me remind you, our safety was our geographical features. The Himalayan region, the Himalayan ranges and the Indian Ocean which was called as Indus Sagara at one time. So this he and Hindu together we made it Hindu. So you must understand it is a geographical entity. We revered the mountains and the ocean because we knew our safety, our well-being and our cultural flourish and our uh, economic prosperity of the time, everything depended on these two barriers which stopped people from invading and doing things. But then if people found ways to cross the mountains and come across and come through the oceans, everything happened. So our problem was just this, we focused on human genius all the time, but we lacked organization. The West always focused on organization, but they did not focus on individual genius. For both there is a price. So now we have come to a place where we cannot 
ignore individual genius, we have to focus on that. At the same time, we need to learn to organize, that's what we are struggling at right now, that we want to organize. Can I ask? So, uh, Sadhguru, um, uh, talking about spirituality, and like I, like I questioned that, how practical is it in today's world, where, whereas like the whole philosophy of spirituality or what… No, spirituality is not a philosophy. I know, it's, it's a technique, it's a practice, which no, no, I no, also no, do, no. it's yoga. No, no. <laughs> it's yoga, it's the, the ultimate union. Okay, so I know yoga is the ultimate union and everything that we do as yoga is supposed to make us inclusive. Inclusive mm. of, of everything. So, let me finish, okay? <laughs> so, so it is supposed to make us inclusive of our environment and then further expanding that our country, our countrymen and then the planet and then the cosmos and that it goes on. But my question is, and I, I want to present an example. I was in London and you know what, it, what happens to when you are in a beautiful city with great infrastructure, you're with a couple of friends and your Indian friends, they're always cursing India. You know, oh, this is so great, where, where we live is a piece of garbage. You know, and on all that, I felt so overwhelmed. I couldn't wait to get to my room and, and when I got there, I was crying. I found myself crying and I was muttering something of the effect that, that, you know, I mean, what do you expect and, you know, why don't they have sympathy for, for, for their own land and all of that? And then I realized that identifying like that with your country, today I'm crying, tomorrow I might just punch somebody and everybody will behave in their own way. So this kind of identification with your environment, with your country, with your religion, with your family is, is the root cause of all atrocities. So isn't that kind of, is, isn't it, Dangerous? Now don't tell me, be inclusive, but still not be inclusive. <laughs> don't try to answer for no. me. No. <laughs> <laughs> I am not buying that answer. How can you be inclusive and yet not be inclusive? If you are inclusive, you are inclusive. <laughs> or you don't be inclusive. Well, uh the city that you're appreciating of its infrastructure and its wealth and well-being, for two centuries was largely built on stolen money from this country. Well, I… we should not… Uh, we should not resent our history and develop uh, animosity towards somebody. But at the same time, it's stupid to forget everything and go on as if nothing happened. That'll be absolutely stupid. That's a problem with us. One thing is, see in this country, what has happened in those two hundred years? Don't go back thousand years, there have been atrocities, that's a different matter. Even if you go back this two hundred years, because we're talking about London, what's happened in this country is not a small thing. Six million Jews died, they write and write and write about it, they make movies about it. Nobody is supposed to forget about it in the world, everybody is reminded every day how this atrocity happened to them. But we… you know, the Bengal famine killed over three and a half million people in a matter of three months because they took away all the food for the World War II effort. And this is not one, the governor uh, in 19, 1860 writes, the fields of India are bleached by the bones of the hand weavers because they destroyed the handloom industry. Yesterday was handloom day or something, yes? From 1800 to 1860, in sixty years' time, an industry which has lasted for ten thousand years, they destroyed and left millions of people to die. It's recorded in British history and uh, you know, in the, what they have written, not what we have written because we write nothing. If we get our breakfast tomorrow, we're just happy. This is a big problem in India because we don't have a sense of history. A history or revenge? No, no, revenge is not needed because revenge will again waste your energy and you… you know, your future is wasted if you this go into is, revenge. Sadhguru, this is what I don't get. Like no, let me… let me finish this. About what is this spiritual process given to us, okay? The question is why can't we be like them and be successful? See, why we are like this is because we have realized 
in a very profound way. Most Indian people may not know this consciously, but they know this by life. They may not be articulating this in their mind. Somewhere they know that their well-being is essentially coming from within. Outside arrangements we can make as we want, but me being joyful, peaceful, loving, blissful is most important. Well, that's why I said individually we did great. Organization also we had great stuff till outside people came who had no concern about anything that you think and feel and experience, everything was brutally uprooted, all right? I'll just tell you an example. For example, you've come to the yoga center, that region, there's one police station with about twelve to fourteen policemen. Uh, about four are on night duty, that means about eight or nine. Two, three will be always on leave. <laughs> I'm saying literally there's no law, it's a quarter million people. There's literally no law at all, but still there's no crime. This is spiritual process, I'm telling you. You take away police in New York City, you take away the law enforcement in New York City or London that you're talking about, just see what'll happen in three hours' time. <laughs>